We're Kyler and Cody McCormick, two brothers on a journey to pave our own path while chasing our passion. While building our adventure filmmaking brand, The Outbound Life, we become sponsored by some of the top brands in the film and travel industries, acquired Fortune 500 clients, and have spoken on stages all across the country sharing our story. We now invite you along on our journey as we sit down with inspiring entrepreneurs, creators, and diverse thought leaders to discuss how to live a life we consider outbound. A life where you believe your story matters and live beyond your limits. Come along and live the outbound life. What's going on, beautiful people? I hope you're having an amazing day, no matter when you might be listening to this podcast. Today, we're sitting down with the one and only Mari Takahashi, better known as Atomic Mari. Now, we met Mari years ago in, in, in a really random way, right? Like, I don't know how these things happen in life, but we ended up speaking on the same panel as her at South by Southwest. Uh, and this was back in the day that events were a thing. And remember, you know, when people used to go places? Yeah, well, we'll get into that story later. But Mari is a professional ballerina turned internet personality and gamer. You know, like the typical life trajectory. She was the third person to join the wildly popular YouTube brand Smosh with channels totaling over 40 million subscribers. Mari is best known for co-founding, hosting, and producing shows for the channels Smosh Games and Smosh Pit, as well as being a contestant on, get this, the 33rd season of CBS's Survivor. She can most recently be seen on Quibi's new show, Speedrun by Polygon. Atomic Mari, what's going on? Wow, man, I don't deserve that intro. That was crazy good. Well, can you intro me everywhere? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, maybe maybe that's the podcast right there. Maybe we turn the microphones off now. Like, I think it's a fun thing when you come across somebody who has such an epic life story that y- you read like one paragraph of their bio and y- it totally blows your mind and you could probably spend the rest of the day just trying to digest that. Such a bizarre story, and, and truly, uh, we're just so stoked to to chat with you, hang with you. Like Kyra's mentioning, we met you in person years back in an event at South by Southwest, but just following you and your journey has been such an inspiration. And I think I think back to that first time that we did connect, there was just something that you were like so, so chill, level-headed, and easy to connect with that we were just like, hey, we have to keep up with Mari and her journey. And actually, I was just seeing on social media, you guys, you and your husband just recently celebrated your second anniversary, wedding anniversary. So congrats with that. Thank you. uh, Lisa and I were hitting our second in September here. So similar timing. And I know, you know, like on this journey of life, marriage, that's a new thing for me, for you guys. I'm curious on this path that you're on, what has marriage taught you or like, how has that drastically changed your life in the last two years? You know, marriage these days is interesting, right? Because it's not like we're in the fifties where it's like your whole life is going to change in the sense that you're going to live with someone for the first time ever. And, you know, there isn't this, um, uh, transition that happens. I would say on the surface level, I think what happens is so much deeper than that. And it's like, I don't, so, so my husband and I have been together for 10 years okay, and wow. we've been married for, for two. And, you know, I, I think it's just this constant understanding that like, it's, it's gonna always be just time put in and really, really valuable work put in. And, you know, it, it, it shouldn't, I, I, I think it doesn't feel like like work work you know what i mean and i think you guys understand it because your work is so enjoyable as well and you know right and 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 i feel that as well but um it's just a constant communication and and constant you know messing up and doing better and figuring yourself out as much as figuring out the other person but having the responsibility to understand yourself is so so wildly important because you know we're we're all going through life, figuring things out, and you can't expect your partner to fix things for you. You know, you have to fix things within yourself. Totally. I feel like the biggest like realization for me is just like (laughs) sharing everything with someone else and then having someone else have your back through everything is just, 
you 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 don't know it until you're there. Like you you there's no way to experience that kind of connection with someone until you've actually like taken that step and made that commitment. And it's just like, I don't know, you think you've grown enough like up to that point, but then when you take that step, it is a whole new a new lease on life, a whole new perspective. And I don't know, I think it's certainly like grown me as on the personal level in ways that I, I truly would not have been able to grow without marriage. Yeah, agreed. It's, it's, um, it's wildly, um, just, I, I don't know. I, I love every moment of it. And like quarantine is interesting, right? Because mm. quarantine oh, yeah. really, I think is, is a, is a stress test of relationships, not just marriages, but friendships and, you know, living with roommates and whatnot. It's a stress totally. test that none of us um, ever imagined ourselves putting ourselves through. And, um, you know, like uh, speaking about Survivor, like hmm. the the week before you, you, you know, start production in the sense of like cameras go live, that right. week prior is the weirdest week where you are you're put to the to the test of like what you can handle socially you're hmm. you're stuck in a, in an area with people that you don't know that you're not allowed to talk with or interact with but they're just around you you can't speak to anyone that you know there's there's you've you know internet phone email everything has been ripped away from you i didn't realize like, that and like oh. how do you how do you do in a situation like that it's such yeah. a weird bubble of a situation that i ha- that that i have a hard time explaining it to people Interesting. but i think we're all going through it in a sense where it's like how do you explain to somebody who's not going through quarantine you know like how do you explain what we're going through to somebody five years ago what we're going through yeah. it just right. sounds bananas yeah like that that's so funny you're totally right i think at this point, we're so used to it, right? It's, it's like, of course, I have to wear a mask when I go to the gas station. Um, and Survivor for you was like something you'd never experienced before. Um, to your point, like totally same with COVID, right? We're, we're not used to being locked in our basements or maybe we're not used to being put on timeout when it comes to business. And last year, everything seemed totally set in stone. You know, I, I think any time we're thrown in a scenario where the rules are different, we have to learn and we're forced to grow. And this can be something out of our control like COVID or as a tool of growth, sometimes we can deliberately choose to subject ourselves to something that will grow us. You know, like like for you and Survivor, uh, or I think about a good friend of mine, uh, his brother, I, I think it was, had this crazy idea and he was like, you know what, to test myself, I wanna go an entire month without talking, you know, a month of silence. And this was kind of like a a test he did on himself. He wanted to see who he would become. He wanted to see what he would learn. And he started seeing all these things that he took for granted, right? He started to become much more grateful and much more resilient. But yeah, I'm always so curious to see like when somebody has to go through COVID or when you, you know, you're you're on Survivor, like how does that change a person? Yeah. Totally. How How do you even get on Survivor? What is, yeah, what's well, his plan? There, there's different ways. Now they have completely nixed the system of um, casting folks. Yeah. And I was I was casted on it. I okay. knew somebody that I worked with who was on uh, The Amazing Race. Mm. And they had casting directors that, that looked for folks to, um, to, to get onto their shows. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, being under the CBS branch, they're kind of sister shows. And so instead of just looking primarily into um, all of the submitted videos, they look for folks that they can cast that might fit a a certain archetype or a role. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had a friend who was already on, I had two friends who was already on um, Amazing Race and, and this casting director was like, Hey, do you know any friends who might be interested in survivor? And so that's how I was cast. Um, but you know, walking away, I came back with so much gratitude more than anything. Mm. And I, it's an interesting one. I, when, when you're stripped of everything that gives you comfort in, in your life, whether it's friends, family, your significant other, your home, um, being able to reach into the fridge anytime you want and have food, Mm. um, having a job and, you know, having a title or whatever it is that, that you don't 
give enough emphasis to that keeps you comfortable um, right. in, in who you are and what you are. Yeah, all the luxuries we're accustomed to. Yeah, I, you don't see it as a luxury until it's gone. And so hmm. when, when I was on the island, I definitely kind of reverted back to like introverted, scared, uh, zero self-confidence, uh, like 15-year-old me. Oh, and it was kind of like thrown into an experiment, this social experiment. And and it was almost like seeing myself from from like a like a different angle, being like, oh. wow, this is still you. And me being like, yeah, mm. this is still me. Like all of these things that that keep me um, I don't know, feeling whole at home. Yeah. yeah. Um, is still not enough to kind of build up who I, who I am without it all. And so it was a wonderful life lesson, Oh wow! a terribly difficult one. Yeah, um, yeah. and, and, you know, like a huge kind of like slap in the face of like, you're not as, you know, you're, you're, you're not as, uh, much as you think you have built yourself mm. up to be. And so it was, it was an entirely, um, new experience and, and something that's, I think pretty hard to emulate without throwing yourself into a really, really difficult situation but yeah. i really think that the things that we're going through right now mm -hmm. worldwide like it it really yeah. is a, a a stress test that no one really thought that they would have to go through their lives and, and i think a lot of you right. know we're peeling a lot of layers and um yeah yeah i was gonna say like i feel like very few people go through or i should say up until covid i feel like very few people could ever relate with something like you going on survivor and having that kind of experience where all those things of life are all stripped all those comforts and and that's where like i think you probably walk through that and then you're like talking with friends or family or whatever about that experience and people just can't relate because it's like it is just such a different experience. And I do think COVID in a way, yeah, it is an experiment basically for us to all to go through to see how we're going to perform and have a lot of our stability of life taken away. Uncertainty is brought into the it's picture. It's like this sandpaper coming in, right? Everything you know, these routines, these luxury, yeah. you know. It could change. And we still, like still, we're months in, months in, and people still don't know what next year is going to be. Like you can't, you can't plan. Like, are you taking a trip to Europe? Are you you know, are you booking these jobs or like you, you don't really know what to do because it all might change, which is such an uncertain kind of feeling. But 100%. that was so interesting how you worded that, how, you know, you go on the show and maybe have all these expectations about what it will be or here's going to be my strategy going into it. And then you find yourself, it's as if this exoskeleton is like thrown out completely. And here we have 15 year old Mari, who's just like, how do I survive here? You know, it's been interesting over the years for, for Cody and I, a big part of our passion and different projects we've gotten to work on has taken us on, you know, sometimes these sort of wild expeditions. And I remember one of them took us to uh, British Columbia. Have you, have you been up to, to BC or, or Banff area, any of those at all? Yeah, it's been a while, but yes, I have. Yeah. Well, yeah. Or Cody, was, was it actually? Um, we were in Alberta? Jasper for that one. Yeah. Which I think is Alberta. Yeah. Um, but, you know, anyway, you go you're thrown into this sort of expedition that you, you know, you have people who they have the maps and they've planned everything and they're avalanche certified and these are your guides. And uh, very quickly, you start to feel your like whatever prejudices or opinions or things about the people you're stuck with that you have. Those just sort of like dissolve when you're like six miles into this thing. And the only thing you could think about is like, oh my gosh, if I had one more cliff bar, my <laughs> life would become the best thing ever. And I don't have that right now. So that's, um, that's really cool to hear about. Um, I mean, what a crazy experience to be on Survivor. I'm curious. So you ended up on Survivor, but I want to rewind a little bit and hear about, you know, little Mari growing up and where this journey, you know, starts with becoming this ballerina from from what I understand a very young age and then eventually going in totally other directions can you bring us back to when you were a kid sure so I'm a second generation ballerina uh, meaning my mom was also a uh, professional ballerina and then a teacher so I was a studio brat from the time I was born um, <laughs> when I was two and a half I I started ballet classes and you know I I just growing up I I just realized that um, ballet would be my destiny in the sense that like, it's the only track that 
I was put on by my parents and mm. then the only track that I thought that I could be on. Um, mm. And I, funny enough, I was having this, this, this deep conversation with my stream last night of like the, um, the, I, I guess the, the things that our parents project on us sometimes mm. and me being not only a girl um, growing up in a very traditional Japanese some and, and oftentimes misogynistic um, mm. culture and also being the the, the younger um, of two siblings. Mm. Um, my brother is nine and a half years older than I am. So oh, wow. I, I pretty much grew up kind of like a, an only child. And mm. so between those two things, I feel like a lot of feelings were projected on me of like, you don't have to do all the work. You're fine. Like, mm. we'll take care of you. Um, and, and don't worry about your future. It's already kind of laid out for you. And in, by doing so, I feel like from my parents' side, you know, they were doing as much as they could to not only protect me, um, to make sure that I was going to be able to feed myself as an adult and, you know, put myself, put, put me on a track for success. And I think mm. from their, their, um, angle, it was out of love. It was out of yeah. um, wanting to do the best they can do as parents. But right. from my a angle growing up, I started to really <sighs> question my ability to to do things on my own. And I questioned hmm. um, just my scope of like being able to put my hands into other things. Yeah. And so ballet was really the only, only, only thing that I did. No extracurricular activities. I always wow. wanted to play soccer and just like mm. kick stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, from two and a half all the way until I graduated high school at 17, it was the, the only really thing that I did other than school. Um, but I was already leaving school uh, midday at okay. lunch mm. in order to oh, wow. start ballet early. Huh. Um, and so from 17, it was kind of, you know, the, the mindset that I would go into this uh, full time with the company. And I really, really, really fought my parents to go to college. And so yeah. they said, okay, mm. fine, you can go to college. Mm. Interesting. Um, and usually it's the opposite. Yeah, right. You're right. And, That's the typical story, right? Yeah, and and especially for um, uh, for for like Asian families, I feel like it's it's the typical where it's like, no, Asian families are very adamant on like you have to become a lawyer, or a doctor, yeah, uh, sure. a nurse, you know, like on that track. And funny enough, my brother did. Okay, um, yeah, I was interested was to to hear his path. Okay, gotcha. Oh man, my brother and I are total opposites. Oh. <laughs> to um, so. Yeah, so so I fought to go to college, um, and I did two years before a ballet company came with like an incredible deal, like like just wow. like bring me to the top as prima ballerin ballerina of the company, blah blah blah. Like wow. a and deal how, I couldn't how walk old away. Were from. you at that point? Nineteen. Nineteen. Okay. Yeah, and I and I was taking professional gigs um, besides that. But this hmm. was like full time. I'd have to quit school eight hours a day, five to six days a week. Um, wow. And so I quit school and, wow. and, I, and I started with this ballet company and I did school at night um, in order to complete college. Because for me, college was like wow. my escape from, from ballet. It was kind of like my way of um, rebelling almost. That is so interesting. It was, <laughs> that is so funny. backwards. But it's out of the norm for you. Like your life yeah. just had a different norm. I think it was my my way of grasping um, independence in some way because I didn't know who I was other than ballet Mari. You know, I had all of these mm -hmm. these um, teen angst feelings and thoughts mm. where where I'm like, ah, parents don't understand. And I listened to a lot yeah. of Linkin Park. So what did you like, <laughs> do with that, right? Because you were dancing all the time. Like I bet to some degree that was kind of you're like, all right, I'm gonna put it into this. Yeah, I I didn't. I couldn't put into into a lot of things, you know, like I, I think yeah. video games for me was one of the things where I felt mm. like a different identity, but oh, yeah. my parents were just oblivious to it. Like they did not care about, about it, but my best friend and I, like, it's the only thing we did. And, you know, I kind of wrapped my personality around the Sega Genesis only because that's what our family had. And uh -huh. uh, my friend yeah. had, 
was a Nintendo family. And so I'm like, yeah, this yeah. is my identity. I'm a Sega kid. Yeah. Um, huh. But other than that, I really can't remember having something to identify myself with other than like bands and music. Mm. Um, so anyway, would you go I, to I, concerts? Would you go to concerts or would I you did. just listen? Okay. No, I would go to concerts by myself. I would go to like Limp Bizkit concerts by oh, myself, man. like so hardcore, like they had like Eminem and Exhibit, um, Snoop Dogg. Like I used to go to these hardcore concerts, <laughs> oh, like it. hardcore back then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, I remember going by myself. Um, but yeah, so I started with the ballet company and, and, and it's kind of like I threw in the towel as far as like reaching beyond that. And it's weird. It, it sounds a little, um, uh, you know, like high horsey because there are so many people who, who sure. dream to become yeah, you're, ballerinas. You're yeah. at the pinnacle of what like you could do in this one arena and you're like, ah, this isn't me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and wow. it's, it, it's like a, a part of me fell in love with the idea of this is it because I, because of my peers, there were so many folks around me in the, in ballet, in the ballet company who was just like, they work tirelessly to get here. And I feel like this was a destiny that was just laid out for me. And I couldn't get to a place where I really felt enough gratitude for it. And, and at the same time, I felt like I wasn't going to do anything else. And so I just had Hmm. to make the most of it. It, Uh It's, it's almost like I threw in the towel and gave up when I was 20. Um, yeah. I'm like, this is the rest of my life. I, I, um, I always yeah. say I, I used to, my life trajectory was dance ballet until my hips break and then teach ballet until the day I die. Like that was wow. the life trajectory and nothing else. Yeah. Um, so until then you, until YouTube came, came, came along. <laughs> yeah. Clearly you're not on that same life trajectory right now. What happened? Like, where was that shift? What, how old were you? Well, at 25, I believe. Yeah, I think I was 25. Um, it was, or maybe I was 24 at that time. I think I might've been 24. It's, it was the summer. And during the summer, um, our ballet company would be off schedule. So mm. um, we wouldn't be getting paid for, I think like six weeks. Okay. And so during those six weeks, like we would all just scramble. We would go uh-huh. on Craigslist. We would go on um, uh, like, uh, what was it called? SF casting, basically Mm -hmm. casting sites to get any side gigs. And so I did everything from being a magician's assistant. I used to do, you know, I used to don like a tutu and be like a ballerina at at like kids' birthday parties. I would basically do anything to just get a (laughs) few bucks. Yeah. You're like, but I'm real. I'm a professional. (laughs) (laughs) And so one of the gigs that came through um, on SF casting, which is basically a Craigslist for actors, musicians, whatnot. Yeah. Um, For a internet channel, um, they needed somebody who spoke Japanese for a sketch comedy um, piece. And it paid 50 bucks and it was in Sacramento. Deal. So I was like, done deal. Well, yeah. This is me. I can speak Japanese and, and Sacramento is two hours away. So love it. Love it. I get the, I get the gig. I go to this place. Ian and Anthony are there. I don't know who they are. We're, <laughs> right. We're just just kind Ian of, and Anthony, just two yeah. fellas. And at this point, this is 2010. They already have 10 million subscribers on Smosh, wow. which in 2010, was a huge deal yeah um yeah they were vying for i think like uh like number one on youtube like most wow. subscribed Insane. but like i think they were like maybe like top 10 at that point sure um and so we're kind of like just talking i i i yeah i i didn't do my research and i was just like oh yeah these guys are cool i think ian and i talked about cars for yeah. for a while um and so, yeah, that turned into, hey, do you want to come back tomorrow for um, like an extended gig? This would be like a weekly show. Um, and I said, uh, maybe I almost didn't show up. I almost didn't show up wow, because I was like, gosh. it's another four hour drive, two hours there, two hours right. back. Um, but it was at a time where I was like, well, I don't have any gigs lined up, so I might as yeah. well go to this audition. Um, and so like, I almost didn't show up and me not showing up could have just 
put me on a completely different oh my gosh. trajectory. Isn't that crazy? Like it's mind so boggling crazy. to think about. I I don't am I allowed to sw- uh, swear on this Go on the it. show? Okay, so <laughs> I, I because of that, I always say, you know, the life motto for for me in general for like business and whatnot is like show up and don't be an asshole. Mm, it's like yeah, it can yeah. it can really it can it can really take you places by just two very simple things. Yeah, and showing like, up, like be on the dance floor. Like you just never no. Yeah. And like you not having any expectations, mm. right? Like you just yeah. never know um just being in a room what can what that can do for you. Um and and sometimes nothing, but Yeah. And to your point, I mean too many people they show up and they're so full of themselves or something like that. And it just like completely changes what could be possible. And actually like to that note I think I remember you sharing that line with us at South by like that was like we had it was like a short conversation and I remember you sharing that and I just remember how you were so humble with how like, you have accomplished so much and I think we'll continue to kind of get into those things and it's so exciting but it's just like you're so humble and you're still so humble and you don't see that a lot of times and that I think at least to me those are the, the kinds of people that I look up to because People that can handle, you know, getting somewhere in life, having some, you know, all these accolades under their name or success in, you know, whatever, however you define that. It's like to not get full of yourself is such a hard thing. Mm-hmm. So it's the people like to still be a kid, to st- still goof around, to still have fun, not take yourself too seriously. Like it's not about. Or at just, least don't be mean. <laughs> yeah. Don't be mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. That was just, I just wanted to add that on. Like uh, I, I see that you take that line to heart. I appreciate mm-hmm. it. You know, I, I feel like in, in, you know, you guys have met incredible folks from so many different walks of life. Like I, th- I feel like we have met too many folks who have done so much more than than any of us yeah, who yeah. are not mean and who are still able to just be humble yep, that it's like yep. how how can you possibly you know act anything less than just nice to folks um love it yeah yeah, yeah. but anyway so you showed up that day you, you went to the gig you're like ah, let's do it let's yeah go. went yeah. to the gig you know and like me being like pr- like a pretentious ballerina i thought this was going to be like a real audition but <laughs> lo and behold i walk in and it's um it's ian anthony and their director uh ryan todd who's who, who had been with them for almost a decade as well um it's the three of them in this strange like oblong like meeting style type of room on one end a really crappy camera on the table and me on the other end on the other side of this oblong like hallway of a room and I forget which question they 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 start with but like I'm expecting like what sort of like working hours are you thinking like yeah. what can you bring to the table as a producer have yeah. you edited before I'm thinking it's yeah. like an audition like, yeah like what's not- your greatest Show weakness your <laughs> do you work yeah. too hard yeah right I think they open with like so what's your favorite Pokemon and I'm like <laughs> what you know like it, like yeah I think it's me being a, like a pretentious ballerina where I'm like what is this unprofessional what is this? yeah excuse me um, yeah <laughs> and so they, they they have these like lines of questions that are ridiculous like uh what are three things that you would bring to a zombie apocalypse um pretty relevant right now do you, you have those eat? in your house right now <laughs> yeah exactly and so I came off as very aloof in that video that went live like maybe a week after and the title of it me not unknowing that this was going to be the thing is who do you want as the next like who, who do you want as like the next person on Smosh? And it's like me and I want to say maybe like six or seven other folks who oh have gosh. been given the, these same set of questions. Mm. And the audience was like all about it. They're like, we like Mari. She seems like she doesn't care. <laughs> 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 and so, you know, by vote and and ultimately by by the discretion of Ian and Anthony, um, I, was, I was voted in, even though I was not the first pick. I wasn't the first pick and it's because I didn't have any production, editing, writing, 
any experience being in front of the camera, speaking. I had zero of those skills, um, but they seem to like my personality. So they're like, can you learn all of these things on the fly? And me being, I don't know, naive. I was like, yeah, I can learn Final Cut Pro 7. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's um, where basically you got brought into Smosh. Yep. And yep. all right, let's assume some people out here don't know what Smosh is. I know a lot of people yes. do. Give me the short of what Smosh is. Smosh is a... Uh, one of the largest comedy brands on YouTube. Um, and they've been around since 2005. I came in in 2010 and it still continues to build upon, um, yeah, internet humor, comedy and improv sketch uh, comedy. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and are you spending most of your time right now on that? Is it completely changed since then? What is like daily life right now? Oh, yeah. So I, I uh, departed in February of this year. Oh, and, wow. and so it's, it's, it's actually really scary being on your, on my own. Um, yeah. Because the first introduction um, into internet life was with 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 a group. Um, yeah, and with such a you know, illustrious group. And yeah. so after 10 years, I'm, I'm kind of on my own and, wow. um, I, I have got a show on Quibi. Congrats. Yeah. We've been seeing stuff about that. Amazing. Uh, Big deal. Thanks. It's, you know, it's still in the gaming realm. Yeah. Um, but the topics that we're hitting have been so, uh, fulfilling and, hmm. Hmm. You know, we've been we've been able to interview everybody from, um, you know, comedians like mm. Kevin Smith cool. and talking wow. about Epic. how uh, comedy is 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 put into games and, mm. you know, nostalgia within games and all the way into um, talking with somebody like Stephen Spawn, who is a disabled mm. gamer who mm. is the um, COO of a company called, um, or an organization, I should say, called Able, Able Gamers, um, and talking about accessibility in video games and how important it is that not just disabled gamers know about it, but everybody know about it. And just how much, you know, we're using like things like uh, closed captioning in not mm. just video games, but television and movie media um, and, and you know, how that benefits everybody and how we should have a little bit more um, uh, insight into it. So wow. yeah, it's been incredibly fulfilling work to wow. be able to talk about yeah. not just video games, but things that are a little bit deeper as well. I just think it's so cool. Like even going back to your survivor experience, you talk about how you went into it with these expectations and then these things have to totally go away. Let's say these training wheels of this is who I am and I have all this experience. Okay, throw all that out. Now what happens? And similarly, it's like you grew, you blew up on the internet, became this internet personality, got to be associated with this massive channel and all these different shows and things around that. And now it's like you kind of get that amazing, fresh, exciting, exhilarating, terrifying role of like once again being that student. And you're like, OK, now more training wheels go away and it's just me. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Like what's what's that been like? Because. You know, I'm sure that's just, you know, one of the things you're working on right now, you know, this this Quibi show speed run. Like what are what's kind of brewing in you? What are some of these projects that you're able to kind of dream up right now that you're kind of a free person? Well, I don't know if I can talk about it. Too yeah, much that's, yet, that's it's fair. Still a little totally. bit in the works, but there is something um, within esports that that mm. I'm very very excited to tap into and you know as much as esports is tied into gaming yeah. it is still such a different segment um compared to what I've what I have been in because I've always been on the entertainment side of it um playing for fun as opposed to esports which is uh competitive and um playing specifically for uh for for rank purposes um but it's it's a whole new monster that i think is is it's still a baby monster i think it's yeah. only going to get bigger um, and and so yeah hopefully we'll be able to announce uh in a little while in a little while wow. um but yeah there will be there's something very exciting brewing in in that but um Amazing. yeah no I, I i think it's i think you tapped on something really important there which is you know the, the word student and mm. you know, 
lifelong student. And um, I, I don't know if it's a concept that is like hammered into us um, enough. Hmm. And perhaps like we have to learn it as adults. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why, why is that not? Cause listen, when I talk to like, just, I mean, like yourself, amazing people, you guys seem to get it. You're doing it. You're like always learning, looking from new perspectives, but like, I don't know. I think you're right. I don't think that is like the norm, the cultural, just like default. Like, why is that such a, a I think a it's because like school I, and I, I, I blame like media, you know, like yeah. there's so many movies and shows out there where it's just like, what are we going to rebel against? We're going <laughs> to rebel against school. We hate teachers, yeah, we hate, of course. <laughs> you know, learning. And there's so many cool things that's not, that's not here. And it's like, I don't know. I, I grew up, um, I, I grew up with the sense that like learning for me was kind of my escape from, from, mm. from like, yeah, school was my escape from dance. Mm. And, and at the same time, I learned so much about learning in dance as well. You know, it's like, I, yeah. And, and like, I don't want to come across as like, I'm ungrateful of no. all the that I had in dancing, but you know, as a kid, you don't really know where to put your anger or your, your angst about, um, about, about life. And so yeah. I would get goats a lot of the times. And, um, you know, it was, is a, it's a fault of mine, uh, where I was using dance as a scapegoat from, for not doing as well as I want to do hmm. in, in school. And then I would use school as a scapegoat, uh, for dance. Like if, if I'm, not dancing as well as I wanted to be dancing, yeah. you know? And so, Interesting. but yeah, I, I think, I think the notion of school not being the cool thing yeah. made us deter away from wanting to, to tie ourselves with the notion of being a student. Also mm, being yeah. a student like implies yeah. that you don't know stuff. Like you're still mm. starting from zero and you, and you need a teacher and um, you need to learn something that might make you feel uncomfortable. And it, it, right. it requires humility. It requires you being like, ah, oh, man, I don't, I don't know anything. Well, I think that's a cultural thing of, of how society looks at people. And it's like you go in for that job interview or like when you, you know, show up and you, you get your Smosh interview and you're expecting to like have to rattle off all these things of like why you're the, the best person for this position. And it all comes with the assumption that like we're the expert. And I think it's so weird that culture puts that pressure on us that like we have to know everything because all it makes us do is like everyone just kind of lies about it. You know, you go in for that interview and you're like, yep, I know exactly what this is. I know exactly how we're going to do it. And I'm the best person for it. And then you go home and you're like, wow, I don't know all that, but I'll figure it out. And I mean, Sure, maybe that that can work as an approach, but it's so weird that culture puts that pressure on us to not be vulnerable or open about like what you actually know so that it can be that like learning opportunity. Because I think, I mean, even if it's just like a standard career path or it's any kind of path in life, the process of learning, it never ends, it never stops. And I think, you know, for for me going through school, it's like I was always a decent student. I never loved school. I love maybe more like the social side of it, but I never like love school. So it would always be like, okay, the weekend. And I would look forward to the weekend. But now that I'm out of it, now I like hunger so much more for learning. And now it's like, you know, I stay up late researching certain things. Like something I've been super interested in as of late is space exploration. And I know we were talking before we went on the podcast with this, but just with all that NASA is like pushing into right now, at least being someone that is intrigued in space travel in exploration of the universe like it's so cool seeing nasa get so involved and engaged and seeing some of these recent launches like the collaboration with spacex sending bob and doug up to the international space station it was just like mind-blowing to watch and i know that you're you're a big nasa fan and i actually i did see on your your twitter recently that you just did a TikTok with bill nye Oh, science yeah. guy how did how did how do you do that like how did you get involved with bill nye and the things that he's into but first a word about our sponsor this podcast is sponsored by Rode microphones the australian pro audio powerhouse making incredible gear for podcasters vloggers 
filmmakers, musicians, and audio engineers. It's it goes back to just just putting yourself out there and just being nice and and yeah. then amazing things happen. You know, um, my husband Peter and I got really inspired by watching a Bill Nye documentary. Hmm. I think I want to say a couple of years ago. And, you know, it was, it was mostly about um, climate change and the things that he is really passionate about. But at the very yeah. end, he's like, and my organization, the planetary society. And we're like, what's the planetary society? <laughs> huh, and <Google. laughs> so um, we just kind of reached out to them and we're like, Hey, we don't know how we can help, but we want to help. We're not experts. We, um, we are fans of space, but by no means are we engineers, educators or anything like that, but we, we want to do anything we can. And we think you guys are cool. And that's really where that relationship started. And they're like, we're just stoked that you're stoked. And we're like, we're stoked. You're stoked. (laughs) Um, and so we, we kind of just got to know the folks who run the organization. Um, and you know, it goes, it goes back to the notion of being a student, right? Because I I think, um, you guys touched upon like feeling like you have to know everything. And when you're a student and when you're a kid, you feel like you can't ask these stupid questions. Otherwise you come off as like being the stupid kid. Yeah. And, and, and Mm. I think I grew up with that. Like I wouldn't raise my hand because I'm like, well, what if I'm the only one who's thinking this? Yeah. Same big time. Yeah. (laughs) And as an adult, you realize everyone's wondering, but no one's asking these questions. Yeah, there's like one hero in the room who's like, well, here, I'll raise my hand. And everyone's yeah. like, oh, thank God. But you kind of don't register that until you're you're an adult. And, you know, like maybe maybe kids these days are different. Perhaps perhaps the, um, you know, Gen Z has got it right. But um, I, I became really scared of not knowing enough. So I would just kind of retract from things that I enjoyed and Hmm. and space has always been one of those things where I'm like oh man it's so cool but I I just I'm just too dumb to be in the room um Hmm. and so uh, my husband and I we we talked to planetary society about this sort of like notion of like wanting to be involved with things like this but but um coming at it from the perspective of like hopefully a lot of people feel this way of like wanting to be involved, but knowing that we don't know everything and that's totally Mm -hmm. okay. Mm. Um, and they were super into it. And so, um, you know, we, we did our, we did our, our role of like educating ourselves enough, but like not, we're we're certainly still not professionals. Um, we went, that's where the majority of people are like, totally. like we're all these outsiders. I'm not a rocket scientist, but now I'm, I'm like following NASA on Facebook and all their platforms and I'm getting all the notifications. Like today they just launched that rocket to Mars with the Rover. That's going to get there in like six, eight months, whatever. Yeah. And it's just cool to like start to get in on the process and watch it. And what's sure. fun, so Mari, you and, and your husband, I mean, you, you guys reach out to like Bill Nye's team and you're getting to know them and you're, you're starting to do these cool things. One of the things is I think, has it been for the last two years that you guys have actually gone to DC and have been a part of some lobbying and talking to government about different issues relating to space. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So through Planetary Society, we've gone to Washington DC to lobby Congress to um, uh, give enough funding to NASA um, when the budgets come out for, Hmm. for the year. And, you know, it sounds really wordy and scary. And trust me, like, it's still scary. Like, we're, again, we're not lobbying professionals. We're we're not engineers who can really speak on this from that angle. But we go into it as citizens and uh, constituents of of our our, um, state government and say, like, we're interested in this. And as citizens, like, we want there to be enough funding for space for this mm-hmm. year. Um, and we get to, to represent Bill Nye's organization in going through oh, this. So but cool. The, the most mind blowing thing is like anyone who's a U.S. citizen can do this. Like mm-hmm. we are able to exercise our voices. And like, I think we're told this in eighth grade when, when we have the choice to go to like a Washington DC trip, but like, <laughs> yeah, somebody said something about that maybe. Yeah. Like it just doesn't like, penetrate in our brains and our hearts 
for all of us, you know, like it maybe oh. it maybe hits that one kid in class who then is like, I'm going to be a state senator. And you're like, yeah, ah, yeah. Joe, and they do Joe's going to yeah. be a state senator. OK, <laughs> <laughs> you go, Joe. But yeah. like, yeah, I think I think the, the point to drive home is like we we all have the uh, not only the ability and the right to, but hmm. in some cases, the responsibility to speak to our, to our, to our government and say like, this is okay, or this is not okay. This is what I'm passionate about. And, um, you know, Pete and I are proof that you can go as just fans of space citizen as, as citizens and just say, this is what we're, we're interested in. And it's, it's important to us. And they very much give us the time of day, you know, like that's we cool. went to, as it should Col- be. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. yeah. I, we, Pete and I were sitting down with Nancy Pelosi's office, <laughs> Kamala Harris's office, like, NBD. and we're like, just folks. We're yeah. Just folks. Yeah. 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 That's so cool. And even hearing that, right, I love that analogy of like the kid who's scared in class to raise his hand because, yeah, all of us struggle with those feelings of unworthiness or I'm not qualified. They're qualified. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny, actually, the other day I was listening to um, an episode of of Tim Ferriss, who I know you're friends with. I remember hearing that at South By. And anyways, he had Hugh Jackman on and he shared this story that I just thought Mm -hmm. was so funny. Hugh is is a huge Tim Ferriss fan and he gets on the show and he's talking about he's like, hey, you know, like, Tim, I got to be honest with you. Like, I was really nervous to do this. I was kind of thinking like, am I intelligent enough? Am I interesting enough to be on the Tim Ferriss show? And I just like I just paused. I'm like, all right, listen, this is the deal in life. This is the ultimate evidence. If like if you if Hugh Jackman doesn't think he's enough, guys, how much more permission do you need to raise your hand to talk to the government? Whatever that thing is, we're like waiting for permission, you know? That's an amazing. I, I just that got was chills. So funny. Like Wolverine. Wolverine. Feel I know, right? That's confidence ridiculous. issues. Then it's okay if you do too. <laughs> Come like, on, Hugh. <laughs> do you like? Do you have? Do you have like a, like any practical thoughts on like wherever we are in life? We're probably scared to raise our hand about something. I'm not enough. Oh, I'm not qualified. What do you have to say to that person? And there's something they're like really on mm. the fence about. Oh man. I mean, there's so many things, you know, like I, and there's so many little mantras, right? Like, like I am enough Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and things like this, but at the end of the day, like, I always say, like, people say like, life is so short, life is so short, but like, I like the mantra that life is very, very long Mm -hmm. and there's, there's much room to, um, have many chapters in your life and, you know, and, and, and hopefully we all live very long lives. Right. But like, I I think the point is you're not stuck in who you are right Mm -hmm. now. You are going to be able to develop into something else and evolve and grow and who you were at 18 or who you were at 25 or even 44 or, you know, 70. It's like, you don't have to stay there. So be patient with yourself and give yourself time to grow out of it. And sometimes it takes a long time. Like I, I am a very, very late Mm. bloomer. Like I didn't start really like, like living by, by rebelling against the confines of what my life was until I was 25. Wow. So, you know, you gotta have patience. Yeah. Give yourself time. Yeah, I know uh, Gary Vee talks about that a lot of like putting in the effort for just years and years because it's like people expect to have that like light switch to go off and just have a new life or like have success or whatever it is. And it's I mean, it's never like that. And you can change and adapt over time, pivot, you know, like I think that's that's like the big word. I feel like the last few years it's like it's okay to pivot, but it is like you have to acknowledge that you don't have to just know your whole life plan from age, you know, 17 or 18 when you graduate high school, like nobody knows their plan. Nobody, again, yeah. back to COVID, the, the most, you know, educated doctors and scientists, they don't know the plan. <laughs> so there you go. Like, it's not certain. Yeah. Uh, Mari, one of the things with the outbound life is we're like, we're so focused on a growth mindset. And one of our core principles is live beyond your limits. And I'm curious, What's something, what's a limit that you've had to push through or grow through specifically in the last year? Um, gosh, that's a great question. I think um, the limits that I've put on myself and, and thinking what my capabilities hmm. were and just trusting the process of like, it, it might not be perfect, 
but doing it is much better than wondering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's just, it seems like it's, um, uh, things that you hear all the time, but, you know, one of the things that I was really scared about was interviewing Hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Um, and even though, you know, I've listened to fantastic interviewers, over time and podcasts and whatnot. And we mentioned Tim Ferriss, like he's, re- he's a really, really good yeah. interviewer. I just was always scared of like, A, asking people for their time yeah. and B, um, carrying on a conversation that was meaningful for the other mm-hmm. person. And this, this role at Quibi has very, very much tested my boundaries of what I thought I was capable wow. of. And so... Yeah, I think interviewing has has been a big one. But, you know, I mean, I, I think we're tested yeah, every yeah. day, especially in the situations that we're in. Um, but well, that's that's yeah. interesting. And even I want to like share on that of for anyone listening, I, Kyler and I feel the same thing of like the people re- we reach out to to be on the podcast, you like literally Kyler and I were talking, we're like, you've been on our list of someone we've want to have, you know, have on the podcast. And it's like, oh, we want to show that we've had, you know, some other reputable people on before we like make that ask. And, and like, you're just so receptive to it. And, and I think for us, it's, it's all about just taking that first step and going for it. And, and also the acknowledgement, and I tell Kyler this a lot, I'm like, a lot of these first podcasts, they're going to suck. Like, we're going to look back like in, you know, a couple of years, and we're going to be like, wow, that was, that was kind of a joke. But at the same time, like, we put in our effort, we put in our research, we put in the time to make them meaningful and they are meaningful to us, you know? So like, mm-hmm. it's worth having the conversations when you want to have those conversations. And, um, and it's a great muscle to grow, even if you don't feel that you're going to be the best at it, because who knows, maybe you're going to be a great interviewer. For sure. I think, in, I think inoculating is a word that Tim Ferriss mm-hmm. has used, but like inoculating yourself of fear and that fear, you know, for, I think for a lot of us is rejection yeah, yeah and like, exactly. just, the, just like embarrassment. Yep. Right. And, and for me, like, um, ha- having, having put out videos so long with a group, there was less fear that the embarrassment would be just on myself. Hmm. And right. so getting over the, um, my fear of like, the light being shined on me being like, Oh, look at this failure over here. Like at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter. And, um, you know, what other, what, what, what other folks, it honestly doesn't matter. And I had this, I had this revelation, um, funny enough, following my mom Mm -hmm. around with a camera on her 25th anniversary of doing Nutcracker productions. Wow. Um, and this was, uh, last December, and realizing like, I have so many stupid selfies of myself. I have so many videos of me doing like, I don't know, whatever things, but I'm like, I don't have a lot of videos of my mom. Huh. And I had this thought where I'm like, the videos that we put out, the content that we put out, the podcasts, these episodes, they're all little breadcrumbs of like, of our lives. And, right. yeah. and, and, and I'm like, well, what do I want to look back on in 10 years and be like, I made that, like, I'm proud of that. Like yeah. that was a chapter of my life that I can, I can go back on and be like, yep, that video or, you know, that podcast or that, or that episode or whatever it is. And, um, I'm like, what really matters is, is getting a thousand likes on something important or is it being able to go back and say, I made that, that thing with my husband, with my wife, yeah. with my best friend, yeah. with, you know, with my neighbor. Um, that was a, a, a family event that happened that, that mattered. And it got yeah. 12 views. Who yeah. cares about the views? Like yeah. when, when you're 50 and looking at this stuff, you're not going to care about how many views it got. You're going to care that you put in the effort to encapsulate a point in your life. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, on that note, Mari, we're probably about approaching that time on the clock here and don't want to take your entire day. So uh, this has been awesome. I know I'm inspired and, you know, everybody listening here, there's, gosh, there's so many nuggets in there. Your story is so inspiring. And I mean, it's palpable, like just hearing you share, you know, with humility and clarity, just like, you know, these different seasons of your life and kind of like uh, in a vulnerable way, showing that you know, you're not alone out there and we're all just figuring this out together. It's amazing. So, uh, you know, on that note, I'd love to 
kind of give you a chance to plug whatever you'd love to, to do. Where can people find you? How can they check out your new show? Uh, how can people keep up with you? Oh, thank you. You guys are so awesome. This is, I feel like this is part one of like many talks. Because oh, yes, please. I feel like we could talk forever. About yeah, I know. I feel yeah. like we barely brushed on. I feel like I warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next time. Uh, um, well, you can find me on um, everywhere online uh, on with my handle at Atomic Mari. And if you happen to have Quibi, then look for the show Speed Run. All one word. Awesome. Amazing. Well, Mari, thanks again. And uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so you. much. A few closing thoughts, guys. First, we're so grateful you took the time to listen today. It really means a lot to us to be able to share our journey with you. Second, if you got any value or inspiration from this episode, please take a minute to leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Lastly, remember, your story matters. So go for it today and live the outbound life.